So thank you everyone for coming. So as Peter said, things are a little tight. We did start on time, and the wine's more important than my talk. So the way we would like to do it is just have clarificatory questions. I'll talk for about 40 minutes. There's some interesting videos on Donald Trump which I want to show you. And then maybe, we, and then of course we'll have our wine. <coughs> so the talk is uh, what affects innovation more, policy or policy uncertainty. And it's joint work with Paul Shu from our enemy school, University of Hong Kong. <laughs> and Yan Shu also from our enemy school, University of Hong Kong. Hong Kong. And uh, an important co-author is Tian Shuan, who was my junior colleague at Indiana University and now in PBC Tsinghua. For those of you who don't know Tian Shuan, he has about 14 A publications, and all his publications are innovation and dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> so he's probably cornered the market on innovation. So this paper, I think, in Shuan's phrase will be innovation and politics. OK. So there is a theory model, which my three empirical co-authors put in their appendix. That's how important the thing I am. So but let me talk to you what's the intuition behind that theory model. So policy and policy uncertainty, why do they matter for innovation? So this is a country I know the best, the United States. So, so the left would be blue and the right would be red as is the usual convention. So the left in the US prefers to subsidize innovations in solar and wind energy. Whereas the right, which is a Republican party, which does not believe in global warming, in the US prefers to subsidize innovations in oil and gas. Now if I'm running an energy company business, and I'm deciding on whether to spend its R&D dollars in developing prototypes of better solar cells, for the new age energies, or better fracking pumps for this oil and gas, the new age for oil and gas, I may wish to postpone this decision until the congressional elections are decided. Because if I choose one of them and the wrong party wins, then I have a problem. So the theoretical model says the following thing, that each party or the policy has a preference for a particular type of innovation. And they have all sorts of regulatory means, taxes being one of them. There's a tax guy there. He said that taxes matter for innovation. Abhinub and Arvinas. So which will promote his favorite innovation, but will discourage the other innovation. So I'd better wait. So thus, while policy orientation affects a firm's innovation choices, so if I'm under the Democrats, I'd like to do uh, the new age things. Or if I'm under the Republican, I'll do, want to do oil and gas. So it does affect my choices. Policy uncertainty certainly slows me down. Now you may say, what's new about this? We know that policy uncertainty slows down investments. And Bernanke had said that many, many, many years ago in a classic paper. So that's why we need a model. So what's the difference between investments and innovation? Investments is an investment in an old technology. So you invest, there may be success or there is a failure. Innovation is an investment in an idea. So if you have invested in an idea, you sort of do a test market or you have a prototype, and you may find that the idea works or does not work. If it works, then it has great potential. So it's a big tail risk. And if it does not work, then you just abandon it, the prototype. So in other words, innovation has a big option value, much more so than investments, even if it's irreplaceable investments. So that the theory model shows. There's a very strong testable implication that political uncertainty affects innovation much more than investments. Okay. Now which matters more for innovation? Now let's come back to our example. Policy may matter if there's a big difference in productivity of innovation in solar and wind energy. So you're investing in prototypes on these new age batteries or wind farms it's really very, very difficult to discover anything there. So either because of the nature of the innovation or because of policies of the left to encourage this innovation, which is that the left may say all sorts of things, but when you've actually done this, they're not promoting it. They're just not business friendly. 
And there may be a big difference in this productivity innovation in solar and wind energy and productivity of innovation in oil and gas, either again because of the nature of the innovation or because of policies of the right to encourage this innovation. So if there is a big difference in productivity of these two types of innovations, if the wrong party wins, the productivity will drop for you if you have chosen the wrong technology. We have discussed in the previous slide, if there is policy uncertainty, you will also wait, productivity will also drop. Which of these two drops is bigger? That is an empirical question. That theory will not be able to answer. So this paper tries to answer that. So does policy matter or does policy uncertainty matter? So which of these two drops is bigger? So for all the PhD students here, formalize the research question as an null hypothesis. It's a horse race. Policy uncertainty in a country affects its innovation more than what policy is adopted. The alternative hypothesis is, no, it's exactly the other way around. Policy in a country affects its innovation more than policy uncertainty. Okay. There's a big literature on policy uncertainty in investment. As I said, it started by Bernanke and goes on and on. But there is a paper by Bloom, and with Vidhan and a few other people, we were interviewing for HKUST in the finance at San Diego, and where were we? San, San, Francisco. San Francisco. And we found that everyone was doing this Bloom paper, and we were told that it's one of the most cited papers in the last few years. There's also empirical work on policy and uncertainty and investment, and I have a few sites here. But I guess there is no paper which is links policy, policy uncertainty, and innovation together. And again, remember, the research question is very simple. Whenever you have policy uncertainty, people will wait, innovation drops. If you have the wrong policy and you have chosen something else, innovation also drops. Which of these two drops is bigger? And there's no literature here. So, now let's look at the data. So where does the data on policy come from? So the World Bank has a database of political institutions. In any year T, where T starts from 1975 to 2010, for 180 countries, they classified the power in that country to be right or left. Now, in parliamentary democracies, the power is the prime minister. In presidential democracies, the power is the president. There are some democracies which are in between. <coughs> so the World Bank makes the decision of who has the power. For autocrats, the autocrat has the power. For dictators, the dictator has the power. For monarchies, the king has the power. So that's the power. And it's right if it's defined as conservative, Christian, democratic, or right wing. So that's their definition. The blue definition is left if it's defined as communist, socialist, social democratic, or left wing. There are two other classifications. One is called centrist. When party position can best be described as centrist, example, a party advocates strengthening private enterprise in a social liberal context. But they will not describe it as centrist if in India, for example, in a particular state, the right wing Hindus and Beijing-oriented Marxists who have it together and form a coalition. That wouldn't be right, a centrist. And finally, for places like Singapore, they quite quite can't, they, you know, they are, are not being able to make up whether it's right or left, so they call it others. So that's green. So for those of you who don't quite know what right is or what left is, the connotation is an economic right and an economic left. So that's a big guy in the economic right. His name is Adam Smith. And his most influential black book is The Wealth of Nations. And his most famous quote is, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect a dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. So it's called self-interested enlightenment. The branding in those governments or societies which are right. In a political term, the power is to the individual. In an economic term, they favor free markets, they favor capital over labor. And if you want, if you're interested in literature, then the great 
anti-communist, anti-socialist books are the books where George Orwell Annual Form 1984. The left, here's Karl Marx, most influential thinker Karl Marx, the most influential book is Das Kapital. The famous quote is, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs, so equalizing. The branding and societies, which well, this is of course, I'm being extreme, call themselves left. The power is to the state over the individual. They like centralized control. They favor labor over capital. And the famous book on this, which is anti-capitalist, I shouldn't say anti-capitalist, anti-individual, which is that if we have a coalition of boys with no authority, then there'll be chaos. So that's gold digs a lot of the flies. And the center is, of course, the guy can't say. Now that's economic policy. And we are very aware of the fact that the World Bank's branding is, though it's economic, in some countries it doesn't quite fit. So in many countries in the world, it's also, it's also religious. So in, there's this religious secular divide. So in India, for example, the ruling party is r religious. The opposition party is secular. There's more of a difference in religion than there is between the economic policies of the two. So what has innovation got to do with this here? Well, it may be, take birth control, for example. The religious party would not like innovations in birth control, things, whereas the secular party may. So we are not quite adamant about the fact and stick to the fact that they define it as right or left. To us, we, all we need is two parties with different policies and different favoritism towards different ways of innovating. Okay, so that's policy. What about policy uncertainty? So as the literature takes, we'll take election year as the year in which there's a lot of political uncertainty. So dummy will be one if T is an election year and zero otherwise. And for those of you who are interested, the cent uh, this will also come from the World Bank database of political institutions. Now you may say, you know, even in democracies, when there's an election, you may know who's going to win. The polls say that this guy's we're going to win what 65% probability, then there is no uncertainty. So we should probably have a tighter measure of uncertainty, and that took us to some time, which is look at elections which were close. Where close is defined as an election where the margin between the winner's vote percentage and the runner-up is within the 5% range. And all these vote percentages, for those of you who are interested, we can get from the Center of Demographic Performance in Binghamton University. Okay. And finally, Shuan Tian's expert on this, where does the data and innovation come from? So the theoretical model has you deciding whether to innovate or not to innovate. So you're deciding on the inputs. And input and innovation is always R&D. But Shuan Tian tells me that the R&D data is very, very bad and different countries have different accounting systems. Nevertheless, to be true to a theoretical model, we look at, get the R&D data for, from WorldScope. So most of the work done in innovation looks at the output of innovation, which is patents. So the primary measure would be patents. And since we'll be looking at, at a country level, we thought, you know, countries specialize in industries. So some countries have manufacturing industries, some countries have service industries, some countries are more into commodities. So it might be better if we do everything at a country industry level. So then we will look at, as we said, the input will be R&D at a country industry level. We look at quantity of patents, which is just the patent counts of all resident inventors. The quality of the patents, which is the citation received by all resident inventors. It's like the Google Scholar site. And there's another dimension called the creativity of the patents, which is who's citing you. So if people from your own industry citing you, you're not supposed to be very, very original. But if people from a lot of industries are citing you, that means you have created something path-breaking. So, so they use a Herfindahl index on that one. So we have these three measures. Okay. So to give you an example, the source for patents is the NDR database. The quantity, this is, we'll define it as a growth level. Why growth level? Because there's a lot of persistence in the level. So we look at everything in changes. So it's a growth level in the patent. So that's a quantity of patents. 
where patent level IT denotes the number of successful patent applications in the United States mm -hmm. that are later granted by the USP, that are invented by the residents of country I and are filed to USP and ERT. So we are looking at the application here, not the grant year. Because the grant year it takes some time. It's like a publication process. So it takes some time. So that's and that's the United uh, filed to the United States. So you may ask, why not file it in some other country? Short and honest answer, we don't have very good data on that. But generally, if you want to invent something, you think it's important, the biggest market is the US, and you'd like to file something there because there's a lot of protection on US filing. Quality is a site count growth, and originality is where are these sites coming from? Is it from your own industry, in which case you're not very original? or it's very dispersed. Okay. So that's quantity, quality, and originality. Now we need to do a little more. We need to normalize innovation. Basically, we are asking the question, which party is better, and it's basically which party is better in that country. So it has, has to be country specific. So when I innovate tests, all we do is, we take the growth level and then we subtract the average growth level in that country in that entire time period. So basically, it's within a country, whether it's above its mean or below its mean. So basically, if we compare a red party with a blue party, it's red party and a blue party in that own country. In the multivariate test, you don't really have to do that. We just use the country fixed effect. Now, why? to filter out the country component and to ensure that the later analysis are not subject to country specific reasons. But there is a profound economic reason for doing that. And the economic reason is the World Bank definition. So the World Bank calls the Christian Democrats in Germany right and the Social Democrats left. But if we talk to any German who's been to the United States, he will think that the Republicans are crazy. So the Christian Democrats in Germany, which the World Bank considers right, actually more left than the left in some countries, like the Democrats in the US. So you're adding apples and oranges. So for us not to do that, we have to have normalize a measure of innovation so it's just relative to a country's mean. So we're just doing it country by country by country. Okay. Screens for countries. So I was preparing this slide last night and I showed it to one of my colleagues and he said, you're in Hong Kong, you'll get into trouble for making this slide. So I changed that. Now let me call it screens for regions, not countries. So how do we start? We start with the top 60 regions with the most patents granted by the US period over the period 1976 to 2005. Now, in that screen, we exclude China, Hong Kong, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab elections because there's no election data for them. There are no elections. Now, we want change. So, in the research design, we want to say we have to have a before and afterwards. So, in these countries, there is no before and afterwards. We exclude Belgium, Cuba, Iran, Taiwan, and Thailand because there's only one party. So, though they have sometimes have elections or what they call elections, only one party wins. And even in, or if another party wins, they have the same policy. So that's also excluded. We exclude Egypt, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore because they are called others. We don't know how to deal with others. And then Czech, Slovenia, and Yugoslavia, as those of you know, this was a part of Czechoslovakia. These all got broken up. There's too much instability in these countries for us to consider it. So that leaves us 43 countries in our final sample starting from Argentina to Venezuela. We think that's a big sample, plus about 25 years of data on this one. Okay. Now, let me show you some univariate statistics. The first thing that I'm going to ask is, is the left better? Second thing, is the right better? Third thing, is the center better? So this is the univariate. This is the year of the election which the left won. And it's left versus the rest. So zero means there's no difference. So left versus the rest, notice that it's decreasing. After the election goes down, before it's also decreasing. But if we look at the confidence band, 
You can't distinguish from zero. That's center versus the rest. And that's the right versus the rest. In other words, no policy is better or worse for innovation in an average country. The left is not better, the right is not better, the center is not better. So for an average country, it doesn't matter which policy. Yeah. Now remember, these are these 43 advanced, most of them advanced democracies. So let me uh, qualify that. Now I'm showing you the univariates. It's my firm belief that if you do not see a result in the univariate, it doesn't exist. If you see a result in the univariate, then you should try to destroy it using the multivariate. But here we don't see any results, so there's nothing to destroy. So, so no policy is better or worse for innovation in an average country. But let's go country by country, which is more interesting. I have a clarity. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the policies are different, right? Are you only focusing on the type of industry or innovations that the left would favor when you do the blue curve? So this is so here we just we don't do anything on the industry. So we, this is all country level. So now the question is simply: Is the left good or bad for innovation on average? On an average, yeah. So this is not at a, at, a, at a industry level. We should do it at an industry level, but then we'll have too many graphs. <laughs> Lots of industries. But I mean, it's six graphs, right? Industry fixed this thing. No, but you could put all the types of industries that the left would favor. Oh, yeah. That's a very good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is at the, just at the country level. Okay. Again, at the country level, which country by country, who's better, left, center, or the right? The center right is actually better in four countries New Zealand, South Korea, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. United Kingdom, it's quite obvious. Uh, it's like Margaret Thatcher saved them. The center left is better in two countries, Austria and Israel. And what about the other 37? No one is better. So that's country by country. Okay, now let's look at political uncertainty. So remember, this is the year of the election. And what we're using here again is patterns. And what I've just shown here is a quantity. The same results hold rough qualitatively for quality as well as originality. According to the theory model, you have uncertainty here. The patent is filed one year later, so we have to look one year later. Notice there is a s s negative drop and significance to this. Here too. Here not so, not, at least not in the innovative. So it seems just by looking at this, policy <laughs> uncertainty does hurt innovation. Well, that's our eyeball test, but we'll go now go to some more formal uh, econometrics. So, some identification I I issues in these democracies, especially the presidential democracies, elections are fixed every four years or six years. So at least timing is exogenous. There's some other endogenous issues. In parliamentary democracies, they have a right to call an election. Generally, according to Julian Wu, who have looked at this, the only country which uses this very strategically is New Zealand. So sort of elections are exogenous, or may not be. And then in our baseline results, we'll control for country industry joint fixed effects. We'll control for year fixed effects, and in, which in some cases there may be some weird years. GDP, lagged innovation the education system in that country, the intellectual property protection in the country, and a few other things that are put in. And finally, we'll have also consider a stricter exogenous election, where the election is quite close. And this will be presidential, because presidential, we know, happens every four years or every six years. So that is regarded as randomly assigning policy. Another idea that came from Paul Shu was that Alberto Alessina and his co-authors have been looking a lot at ethnic uh, fragmentation of various countries. So political uncertainty matters more for countries which are very ethnically stratified. So we look at ethnic stratification of various countries. And finally, in all these papers, my honest criticism, why does this happen? So we like to pin down the channel 
And we'll find that in the year of the election, there are actually fewer inventors and fewer firms filing patents. This is not quite true when we look across policies. Okay. So here's a panel regressions. So this is innovation on the left-hand side next year, where it's, it's going to be patent, growth, citation, growth, or originality of industry J in country I, one year later. We only present in this presentation the patent growth for brevity, but you can see the rest in the paper. First is right versus everyone else, and the next one is left versus everyone else. Election is a variable equal to one if there's at least one election in country I in year T and zero otherwise. This measures political uncertainty. So the coefficient of interest is beta one. The coefficient of interest is also beta two, which is just policy matter. So right is an indicative variable that equals one if the country's I government is right wing and zero otherwise. And left is an indicative that equals one if country I's government is left wing and zero otherwise. This measures policy. And then we have the other things, growth rates and the country of fixed effects. Now remember, there were six countries in which policy did matter. So we'll do it for the 43 country sample and the 37 country sample as well. I'm showing the 43 as one. What do we notice? In the election year, however you measure innovation, patent growth, citation growth, originality growth, it drops. There's no effect on policies. Left doesn't matter, right doesn't matter. And there are, of course, effects on the other things. Past innovations have an effect because innovation has a persistent component to it. Okay. This is the one that I actually like the best. So there are measures of ethnic stratification. So one measure is the, la the share of the largest ethnic group. So the share of the largest ethnic group is very, very high. This country is not stratified. Another is the Herfindahl index of these ethnic groups. So there, therefore, we can measure how stratified this country is. This is high stratification. That means there's a lot of ethnic problems. Low, high, low. We run our same regression. And what we find is if there is, so this is, sorry, low according to the Herfindahl index means there's a lot of fragmentation here. There's a lot of fragmentation here. If the fragmentation is very high, the political uncertainty really has an effect. If the fragmentation is less, the political uncertainty doesn't have an effect. So therefore, we do a statistical test between the difference between these two components, low minus high, and you can see it's almost statistically significant. T is minus 1.999. Of course, ethnic concentrations don't change. So that's why it's, this is a nice trip, test. Okay, now let's do closed presidential elections. So instead of election, we just put closed presidential elections, close or not close. And again, we notice the only thing that matters is it should be close here, close elections. And the number, the coefficients are much larger than elections. So when the elections are very close, it affects it even more. Again, policy doesn't matter at all. Finally, incentives. The, the channels, where we measure incentive by the number of inventors or the number of firms filing patents on that election year. Same type of uh, right-hand side variables. And whether you measure it by inventor or assignee, assignee means a firm, what we notice is, yes, it is statistically drops by inventors, not so for assignees, though the sign is negative. So, let me conclude then. Though dramatic policy differences may exist between opposing political parties and democracies, as long as innovation productivity is similar under these parties, so again, productivity for solar gas, you have as many patents as you have for fracking, which you find for 37 of the 43 countries, our results suggest that policy uncertainty matters more than policy for innovation. So it's interesting, it seems that the level doesn't matter, but the second moment does matter. This implies that businesses can adapt their innovations to different policies. So they are like children in a troubled marriage. And they can probably adapt to a divorce as well. They just would like to have the marriage ended fast. They do not like that answer. 
So they face a problem, they do not know which policy to adapt. Therefore, for most countries, not all, the resolution of policy uncertainty is more critical for technological growth than what policy is actually adopted. The paper does have a very strong political conclusion. Politicians, please heed. Speedy compromise is good for technological growth. Even if you have to surrender most of your policies to get this compromise, at least for those 37 countries. So, is political compromise possible? Let's see. My country. Let's watch this YouTube. <laughs> Oops, how do I do this? Okay. I hit on it. Oh. All those wonderful Donald Trump things gone. <laughs> to uh, control. <coughs> okay. Okay. Control, click, enter. Control, click, enter. Control, click. No. Just copy and paste. Just copy and paste. We'll go back into prison. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely great. September 30th that I stood to do. Mary McLeod, no way. A couple of young women took over the microphone from Bernie a month ago, right? They took it over and he was like this, huh? He is not stopping ISIS, I will tell you. If we had honest government, Hillary wouldn't be allowed to run in this country. He wouldn't be allowed to run. You know that. You better remember, there's a six-year statute of limitations on that crime. So Hillary's running for a lot of reasons. One of them is because she wants to stay out of jail. And I will tell you that if I win, we're going to look into that crime very, very seriously, folks. Very, very serious. Well, she has a new hairdo. Did you notice that today? That's called a wig. Is that a wig? I think it's a wig, nothing personal. I don't, I'm not against wigs. People can wear whatever they want. Okay, it's okay. But you know, I, I tell you what, it really was shocking to see it because you're right. It must be. It was. It was massive. You know, her hair became massive. You know, you're going to get in trouble now. I don't care. The, one of the worst secretary of states in the history of the country. She talks about me being dangerous. She's killed hundreds of thousands of people with her stupidity. People are getting away with murder. I never saw anything like this. You can say anything about anybody, and their poll numbers go up. If you try and hit your mother over the head with a hammer, your poll numbers go up. He said he tried to stab somebody, hit the belt buckle. Okay. And the next one. And the next one is our particular region. Hong Kong Security Commission of the Legislative Council has held a special meeting to discuss how the police dealt with the Mong Kok riot. The Secretary of the Security of Bureau said during the riot's peak there were about 700 rioters gathering in about 14 streets and 2,000 floor tiles prying up. He criticized their behavior as an ignorance of law. The official also said over 90 police were injured. He added the police will never put up with the riot and will investigate whether any group was involved. As of Monday, 68 people have already been arrested and 41 have been charged. Thank you. Okay, questions? Sir. Uh, so thank you, to Paul, for a very efficient use of time. Uh, we have uh, 15, 20 minutes available for Q&A and controversial debate. That's all. 
let's get a few more mics. Oh, I'll go ahead. I think I can. Okay. I don't need to wait for a mic. But one thing I, you know, I was surprised at the effect that some of it was so immediate. And that quite often, the innovations that generate a patent may, you know, go on for quite a time. And I'm wondering. Did, were you able to do any tests to assess whether this is just a sort of delaying effect where people are just sitting on a patent and holding off filing until the next year? So I guess you could do that by looking at lags. It's a very good suggestion. Uh, my answer to that is I think we were just lazy. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next year. We should have looked at the year after that and the year after that to yeah. see if there's, if there's any uh, accumulator over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. It could be that they were sitting on this and filing later. Because it is like filing for patents is it's not innovation, right? They could be doing innovation, but exactly as he said, they're not, uh, they're not doing anything about it. Yeah. Right? They don't want people to know. That is true. Filing for patents is not innovation, but say that to the hundreds of papers which are used <laughs> yeah. as innovation measures. So, if, so couldn't you use some direct measure? We did. Uh, I forgot to tell you. So my favorite measure is the input because the theory model is the input. The R so R&D. Yeah. So we have the same results in the R&D, which I should have presented. But they are not as strong as the patterns. Yes, I think it's quite kind of puzzle why the policy themselves has no effect, but the, the policy uncertainty has. Right? Because you, one would assume that uh, uh, th that uh, you know, the, the policy produce uh, effect, but policy uncertainty may not. Right? Yeah. But the other way around is kind of very strange. It's because, very strange. Uh, if something like fundamental, like themselves, do not produce results, yeah. why would the uh, you know, one way or another, um, uh, make change. So, yeah. but but my uh, own interpretation of why that is the case is actually, I I think that uh, when you say policy, uh, this is actually seem to me representing the ideological position of ruling party rather than policy themselves, even not the policy direction. Because uh, if you look at the China, right, the uh, Communist Party. So if you look at uh, their ideological position, it's very clear. But if you look at the policy the Chinese the Communist Party pay, there are a lot of policy that are more right than the <coughs> Catholic. Party. So, so you've asked a lot of questions. So let me answer them one by one. So the first question is a great question, which is that why does policy not matter, but policy and uncertainty matter, that matter? And I teach, tell my co-authors, that's why we need a theory model. So the theory model is the following thing, which is that Policy here is a preference for a particular type of innovation. That's the precise definition for a policy. So there are two parties, X and Y. X has a preference for policy small x, and Y has a preference for policy small y. And if X wins and the small x policy uh, innovations take place, then the output goes this way, and the small y output goes this way. And both the outputs are roughly similar. So that's why the policies don't matter. What happens is if the wrong party wins. So we invested in this type of technology and this party wins, which has a preference for some other innovation. Then what happens is that they hit your productivity. So sitting at t equal to zero, ex ante both those policies look right. But at the election year, you don't know which party is going to win. So if the right party wins, this productivity is going to go up. But if the wrong party wins, the productivity is going to really fall. So it's better, therefore, for you to Wait. So that's the reason why policy uncertainty matters. Policy may not matter. The productivity of those two things are the same, which is true for the 37 of the 43 countries. It's not true for six of them. Now, coming back to China, don't take this right and the left as the economic thing too seriously, because I've been thinking about India for a long time. It is a preference for a particular type of innovation. That's all we need. So the, this party has a preference for this type of innovation. This party has a preference for that type of innovation. That preference is what I call policy. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rosalia. Given your model, which really does explain, because all this while I've been wondering why people have these rational expectations. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense what you said. But then the natural test is to see which industry uh, are affected. You should be finding that when a left government comes into power, whatever industries they might favor, innovation there should be that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the opposite for the right, so that they average out so that there's more Yeah, effect. should be done. Haven't done it. Okay. If you take mo the model seriously, that certainly should be done. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. 
The first one, how do you rule out the uh, explanation that is caused by business cycle? Because there's a whole strand of literature on elections and business cycle, suggesting that those business up and downs also like, correlate to those elections. So maybe it's just, I'm not sure whether it's a cause of business cycle or a consequence of business cycle, as you observe here. The second is, is I think, the subsets of countries that dropped might serve as a good, like, placeable t like test. It, even though there's no elections, but there's a, there a change of switching political regime, so that you can see whether this change political regime actually matters, matters or not. Okay. And then so you have asked me two questions. So the first question is business cycles. So our sort of crude control for that is, is the control of the GDP. So uh, all these multivariate regressions control for GDP. Well, but, if that's but, but business cycles, remember, most of our countries have fixed election times every four years and six years. Except for certain parliamentary democracies where there's a little choice. So if you have every four years and every six years, I'm sure that this will not affect this. Because this is every four years, it's fixed in stone. Your second question is much more interesting, which is placebo test. People are always asking, okay, so you're sure that political instability is bad for innovation. Everyone should be like China, then. strong political stability. Well, is it strong political stability? Maybe there it is. But I'm overemphasizing my effect of politics on innovation. Innovation is caused by a lot of other things as well. And countries which have strong political stabilities, like countries with strong monarchies or things like that, may not have the other ingredients that innovation requires. One is the big one is tolerance for failure. Dissent is a very important ingredient for innovation. So these are things which are also require for innovation, which I don't show. I'm just overemphasizing my effect of politics. Don't take it literally by saying that means we should just have not have any elections at all. Yeah. So, so I think any kind of uncertainty should affect a host of policy decisions, so not just innovation. So it should be investment should be affected. Uh, they should take on less debt. Uh, they should, you know, have di different dividend policies. So why why are you only looking at innovation instead of looking at other things that policy uncertainty might also affect? Oh, that's because Shuantian is in the paper. Okay. Remember, it's innovation. <laughs> dot dot dot. <laughs> We are, so, but if I take my pay, uh, model seriously, the model has a testable implication that it affects innovation much more than investments. So we also now try to at least get them to look at investments. Okay. Now, investments across various countries uh, mm -hmm. at a firm level, a little more difficult to do just for them, but we'll try to do that. Mm -hmm. But then we can think of other things also, like you were saying, debt, this, Leverage that. Policy. This is where taste issue comes in. You say, well, if I do that, mm -hmm. the referee will say, why is this interesting? Apparently, everyone thinks innovation is interesting. Yeah. So, you know, related relate to uh, Vidal's question, so I think the uh, invest innovation maybe you think about one type of innovation. Oh, uh, invest, right? I think it's better. It's just my suggestion. Maybe you can speed down further. Why the policy uncertainty is in particular relevant to the innovation, you know, versus to investments. Well, that's what we answered in the theory model. Oh, so yeah, yeah. So the theory model has this. So what has? So the theory model has investment is you decide to invest or not to invest. There's a probability of success and a probability of failure. Innovation is you decide to ha make a prototype. So it's an investment into a new idea. If this idea works, it works spectacularly. If it doesn't, then you can drop it. So there's a huge upside potential and the downside potential. So there's a much more option value okay. to it, innovation than there is to investments. So the model that it's very clear, it's like night and day, that uncertainty affects innovation much more than it does affect yes. investments. That should be tested. And that's the first test of the model. I guess we are not doing that. In the data, I know. Uh no, the Sujata's point is very, so the model says the following thing, which is that the definition of policy in the model is a preference for a particular type of innovation. The left likes this type of innovation, the right likes this type of innovation. So one test of the model is, is that really true? We haven't tested. Yeah. So how do you deal with the lag effect between the events such as election and the, the, the patenting part, right? Because a, I, I, I would assume that the process uh, 
for getting a patent, you need to first invest the number of years later, then you can find yeah. it. But, but then, you know, uh, how long will be the lag effect for you to predict uh, behavior, like, like the election results, so will uh, kind of uh, have impact on the next run of uh, um, the innovation activity? So one answer to this question is, suppose you start uh, investing in an idea right now, five years later, you get to know whether they're successful or not. Then what will happen is, there's an election here, five years later you'll see a drop in patterns. But that's assuming that it takes five years. We don't know how long it takes. But then, what do you do in the model? In the, <laughs> in the model it's just, in the, in when all these theory models you put T, T plus one, <laughs> T minus four. So T plus one we literally took as one year. And everything was measured with respect to one year. Yeah, but the theory model is okay. Yeah. What about empirical models that you would have to... We should also look at what happens two years later, mm -hmm. three years later, four years later. Yeah. It becomes a little more complicated there. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, I think, I think you mentioned about the uh, quality of patents and originality, but I, maybe I slept through it. But did you talk about how those would be affected? Yeah, I didn't, but in the paper it is exactly the same way. But what, yeah. why would that be? I mean, why should the quality be different in that year? So, but the thing is that if you no, no. So, if you're not doing anything this year, if you're waiting, yeah, why should have poor quality then? <laughs> because you don't have any quality. Yeah. No <laughs> quality means no quality, no originality. That's what it means. <laughs> so, for to have a quality, it's necessary to have quantity, right? Not sufficient. So that so that's the reason. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> In my opening remarks, I suggested that there's a difference between policy and politics, politics being the dark side. So that's the first point. Uh, the implication I take away from your results, I'm wondering if the, your power to identify the policy is sufficiently high. I think you're, what you've identified in terms of politics or the uncertainty, I buy that. But if the power between those two things is different, then I'm not sure you can really make this contrast. That, no, no, that criticism is well taken, but I make an assumption here that these are 43 democracies, most of them advanced democracies, so a political party is associated with a policy. If there is a political party which has no policy, except the policy to win, then I can't interpret it the way I am doing it right now. Was another question. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, one more quick one, which was uh, thinking about this. Uh, you know, another story one could tell is, is that patents are actually quite expensive. Uh, and then, in some cases, many companies, I think, file them almost for strategic reasons. And you know, maybe are you picking up something where companies are sort of cutting back on kind of, you might, well, it wouldn't be unnecessary, but sort of discretionary spending because of the sort of a broader uncertainty about political, they're uncertain about the, maybe the earnings as a result of the election. It's a, it, do you have anything, measures of other kinds of corporate spending? So that, that was Vedan's question. Um, okay. So, but if I take my theory models seriously, it has little to say about output, it has to say yeah. about input. Yeah, yeah. So the input that we're looking at is R&D. Yeah, yeah. And we have the same result for the R&D. And the nice yeah. thing with the R&D is that we don't have to worry about the lead lag effect. It's R&D that year, yeah, yeah. and that's what we see. But R&D comes with its own problems because every country has different accounting systems, so they measure R&D a little differently. Yeah. Plus, the World Scope database doesn't have very good population of the R&D data on various countries of the world. So, so I think you said something about inventor. So do you also look at the number of inventors they hire that year? Because if they're doing less innovation, they would hire less people who do innovation also. So that's another input into innovation, right? So we don't look at hiring of inventors, but we, but there are a lot of patents uh, being done, but not from the firm, but by the inventor himself. Mm -hmm. We find the inventor himself is decreasing the number of patents he's filing. Okay. So this, and so the, we do it at the inventor level as well as the firm yeah. level. Thank you very much. Thank you.